Today I want to talk about the pure competition paradox. It's a paradox for libertarianism that doesn't involve any other significant principle. It does not involve, in particular, a Pareto principle of any kind. And so it's surprising. It, on the other hand, corresponds very nicely to a simple game in which there is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. And so what you have are basically two parties, each of whom gets to make a choice, but cares a lot about what the other person does and the way the choices relate. And so you essentially have them chasing each other around a sort of circle. One does something, the other doesn't like it, and so responds with something else. That first person doesn't like it, etc. And so it goes back and forth. Remember that the libertarian principle was one that said that each person ought to have a sphere of liberty, a range of decisions, about which others have no say. Another way of putting it is to say that for each person, there are choices that a social choice function should respect. It should choose whatever that person chooses. And so we're going to look at a case where applying that principle actually leads us into trouble without the involvement of anything else. It is a situation of pure competition. That is to say, a situation in which people's preferences are exactly the opposite of one another. The options that one person ranks one, two, three, and four, first, second, third, and fourth, the other ranks fourth, third, second, and first. And in a situation like that, it is very easy. Now, it's not inevitable. There are games where there is a national equilibrium and where, correspondingly, we won't get a paradoxical situation. But sometimes we do get such a paradox. So let's talk about a very simple case. Let's imagine that among the things that you can control under the libertarian principle is the color you paint your house. Now, of course, I realize I'm lucky I live in an area where there is no homeowners association. There's nobody to yell at you if you paint your house a strange color. However, not everybody has that liberty. So if you like, you can think of this as happening within a range of colors, all of which are approved. But allowing some variation, suppose then each person has the right to paint their own house whatever color they want. If you don't like that, then imagine it being people being allowed to wear clothing of a certain color or whatever. It doesn't really matter. We can adapt this situation to whatever you agree is within the range of a libertarian principle. Let's meet our protagonist. The first is Ms. White. She likes houses painted white. But even more so, she's a nonconformist. She wants her house to be a different color from that of her neighbor. That might work out just fine. After all, there might be lots of approved colors. White is only one of them. And so odds might be in her favor. After all, her neighbor may prefer a different color. But in this case, our other protagonist, her neighbor, is Ms. Brown. She likes to have her house painted brown. Well, so far, so good. But she's also a conformist. She likes for all the houses in the neighborhood to be painted the same color. And in particular, she wants her house painted the same color as her neighbor's house. This is going to lead us into trouble, as you might imagine. Ms. White is a nonconformist. She wants her house a different color. But Ms. Brown, she wants her house to be the same color. And now you can see the basic dynamic. As soon as the colors are the same, well, the nonconformist, Ms. White, is going to say, mm, I better paint mine a different color. And the moment that they are different colors, Ms. Brown is going to say, I, I don't like this at all. I want them all to be the same color and is going to paint her house to match her neighbors. And it's simply going to go back and forth. So here's how we might imagine the four possibilities. Both houses might be white, both might be brown. One might be brown, one might be white. So let's think about their preferences. First consider Ms. White. She likes the color white and she's a nonconformist. So her first choice is to have her house painted white and her neighbor's house painted brown. Well, since her neighbor prefers brown, you might think that's simply the ideal situation. Hey, each of you paint the house the color you want to paint it, no problem. And it wouldn't be a problem, except that their color preferences are actually less important to each of them than whether they match or fail to match 
the color of their neighbor's house. So what's the rest of the list of preferences of Ms. White look like? Being a nonconformist, her second choice is that her house at least be a different color. So she wants her house, let's say the only choices are white and brown, she would prefer that her house then be brown and her neighbors be white. Not as good as hers being white and her neighbors being brown, but a second choice. Her third choice is that, look, if they have to be the same, at least she'd like them to both to be white, since she prefers white to brown. Her last choice is that both be brown. Now, Ms. Brown loves the color brown, and she would like both houses painted brown. She definitely wants hers painted brown, but she also really likes brown on her neighbor's house, and so she wants the exact opposite of what Ms. White wants. She wants both houses to be brown. Well, if she can't have that, then at least she wants them to match. And so her second choice is that they're both white. Well, suppose she can't have that. Suppose they have to be different colors. Ah, that makes her unhappy. But she thinks, well, at least I would like for my own house to be white and my neighbor's house brown. Now, that sounds a bit counterintuitive. Why would she prefer that? Well, because she looks out her window. She spends a lot of time inside. She works from home, and she wants to see a white house. So actually, the color of her neighbor's house is more important to her than the color of her own house. She spends most of the time looking at her neighbor's house rather than her own. Her last choice is that they be different colors and that hers be brown while her neighbor's is white. Then why she looks out and she sees white. She doesn't like that. So in this situation, their preferences are exact opposites. What Ms. White prefers, what is her first choice, is actually Ms. Brown's last choice, and vice versa. So they are exact inverses of one another. So where's the paradox here? Well, here's the situation we might think is going to happen. Initially, they each paint their house the color they prefer. And so Ms. White paints hers white, Ms. Brown paints hers brown. Well, that seems to fall within the liber libertarian sphere. They each get to choose the color of their own house. But now, are they happy with that? Well, Ms. White is. But Ms. Brown looks and says, Oh, I know I like brown, but now our houses are different colors. I really want them to be the same color. And so what does she do? Well, she only has control over her own house's color. It's now brown, but she can make it match her neighbors by painting hers white. So she does that. So what happens is that we get led around in a cycle. The social preference ordering, the social choice function ends up being cyclic. Why? Well, initially we start out with Ms. White having a white house, Ms. Brown having a brown house. But wait a minute. Ms. Brown has the right to paint her own house as she wants, and she chooses under those circumstances to paint hers white, so the social choice function should respect that. But now we've got two white houses. That displeases the nonconformist, Ms. White, so she paints hers brown. Well, that means the social choice function should prefer that. But wait a minute. Now we've got Ms. Brown being very unhappy at the difference in color, so she paints hers brown. This gets her to her best choice, and the social choice function has to respect her preference. But at this point, Ms. White says, wait a minute, <laughs> I want my own house to be white, and I want them to be different, so she paints her house white. The social choice function should respect that, and so it prefers that, and so we get a loop in the social preference ordering. Now notice what's happened here. We get a cyclic preference even without the libertarian principle coming into conflict with any other sort of principle at all. We don't have to assume anything about unanimity or anything except, well, the fact that we should get some kind of social choice function, some kind of preference ordering out of any sort of situation, including one where they have completely opposite preferences. So in a situation of pure competition, where any gain for one is a loss for the other in the preference ordering, 
we can actually end up in exactly such a situation. So there is, in a subtle way, another principle involved, which is the unrestricted domain condition. We might think that the solution to this is simply to say, look, you two are a mess. <laughs> the social preference ordering simply tilts in this situation. It does not yield an outcome. And so our social choice function is gappy. It simply has nothing to say here. Maybe that's the right solution. But in any case, there are situations like this where we're going to end up in a circumstance where the social choice function, if we think it exists, has a cycle in it. And that seems like a paradigm of irrationality. So combining those two conditions, the libertarian principle with an unrestricted domain condition, generates our problem. You might say there's something else, even more profound, that generates the problem. And it's connected to that unrestricted domain condition. We have two people here who care more about conformity or non-conformity than they do about the color of their own house. If that weren't true, if each said, yes, I have a preference, I'd rather be different, or I'd rather be the same as the neighbor, but nevertheless, I care more about the color, then we wouldn't be led into this cycle. So it's where those other directed preferences, the busybody interests, as Gibbard puts it, actually take precedence over other self-regarding preferences. Consequently, you might call this instead of the pure competition paradox, the busybody paradox. Because two busybodies put together who care more about conforming or non-conforming to the other, in short, who care more about what the other person is doing than they care about what they're doing, that creates a situation where the libertarian principle gets into trouble. So here is one way of thinking about the libertarian principle, such as John Stuart Mill's harm principle, or really any principle that says, look, there ought to be some choices you just get to make for yourself. That's fine, as long as you aren't a busybody, as long as you don't care even more about the things that other people are doing. If you do, that principle can get us into trouble.